Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone. This is the second part of Pathogens and Diseases. This is Lecture 55 of Module 11. So like I said in the previous part, uh, we have already covered the nature of microbe and human interactions. What are the different types of interactions, both adverse as well as beneficial. We've also looked at some pathogens and diseases. We are going to continue with that. And towards the end of this topic, we will cover a little bit about epidemiology. So let's uh, take a look at microbial virulence. Now, we already know that pathogens can be bacterial, viral, protozoa, all kinds of microbes exist. Do all microbes which cause diseases, let us say that if a particular pathogen or a particular parasite is known to cause a disease, um, is the relative ability to cause the disease going to be the same? And the answer is no, no way. By no means is it going to be the same. And uh, this also has to do with the degree of pathogenicity of that organism or the parasite. And I will show you some examples a little bit later. Then second is the attenuation or the decrease in the virulence of the pathogen when it is cultured in the laboratory. So for example, let's say you take a sample from an infected person and then you culture it in the lab and perhaps reinfect another person. There is some likelihood that there will be decreased virulence of that pathogen that has been cultured in the lab. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Like I said in the last uh, lecture, this remains the domain of medical experts and we're not trying to compete with medical experts over here. So we just want to be aware of some of the fundamental principles that are part of uh, microbe human interactions, diseases and their control and so on. So just some idea is necessary for all of us, but by no means are we going to go into any details. Uh, so, attenuation is most likely because of mutations that happen to the virulent strain and make it less virulent. And uh, the, this attenuation does not occur when the infection is passed from one animal to another over a short period of time. I again come back to the example of COVID-19. We have seen that there is very little attenuation of the virulence of this virus as it is being passed from one human being to another. So this is not happening from host to host. Um, when the infection is passed from host to host, it's not getting attenuated. Let's also take a look at another issue that is related to uh, pathogenic uh, organisms and these are toxins. So you have poisonous substances that are secreted. Uh, in this case, I have written bacteria, but these toxins can be associated with algae. If you remember in uh, one of the initial lectures, I mentioned something about red algae. Red algae secretes a particular toxin. It's an exotoxin, which is um, it's a neurotoxin and has been responsible for the death of many people who go swimming in areas that are affected by red algae. So these toxins can be poisonous substances secreted by bacteria, algae and many other microorganisms. There are two major groups, endotoxins and exotoxins. So by definition, endotoxins are when the toxin is retained in the, bac um, in the bacterial cell or any other cell in the microbial cell. If it's an exotoxin, it means the toxin is secreted into the cell environment. And within um, endotoxins, 
we also i'm sorry within exotoxins we have enterotoxins entero by definition means within the gastrointestinal tract so these type of exotoxins that act in the small intestine can cause diarrhea stomach upset and all these kinds of things so very often when we talk about contaminated food and water and we have a stomach upset or diarrhea that's because of perhaps these types of toxins let me show you some examples of these kinds of uh, exotoxins so we have here uh, this is an incomplete list the actual list is in table 11.5 of the uh, brock 1988 edition so you have an organism clostridium botulinum uh, this is responsible for what is called food poisoning or botulism it's a neurotoxin it causes flaccid paralysis then you have clostridium tetani and again same issue um, we have a disease called tetanus and those of you like me i i often fall and uh, injure myself one of the things that we learned at least i learned very early in my childhood was that if you have a uh, fallen and injured yourself the first thing you need to do especially if you're in contact with dirt on the road and any other place you need to go to the hospital and get what is called an anti-tetanus injection so that is because of this uh, particular organism this is something that's very common in soil and it causes a neurotoxic effect and causes spastic paralysis uh, clostridium perfringens uh, causes food poisoning, gas gangrene, and the table in the textbook has alpha, beta, gamma, lambda. All these toxins are mentioned and they are all responsible for causing hemolysis. Vibrio cholerae is the causative agent of cholera. It produces enterotoxins and results in fluid loss from intestinal cells. E. coli, the virulent strain of E. coli, can cause gastroenteritis it's an enterotoxin again remember these are both examples of enterotoxins and the same effect fluid loss from intestinal cells shigella dysenteriae uh, causes bacterial dysentery and it's also a neurotoxin it causes paralysis hemorrhage and so, uh, so many other effects yersinia pestis is the causative agent of the plague so the toxin is called the plague toxin and it's responsible for killing cells. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a very common environmental bacteria. You find it anywhere and everywhere. It causes any number of infections including gastroenteritis, stomach upsets, all of that and it secretes toxins. Same effect, it kills cells. Uh, so there is another issue over here and that is the differences between exotoxins and endotoxins. You can refer to the original in the textbook but I'll just explain some of these effects to you right here. So what are the major differences between exotoxins and endotoxins? The first thing is their chemical properties. The proteins that are excreted uh, in terms of exotoxins, they are actually proteins that are excreted by certain gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria and they are considered to be heat sensitive. So if you boil the water, you are likely to be able to get rid of them. And uh, if it's an endotoxin, it is because of the lipopolysaccharide or the lipoprotein complexes that are released when the cell lyses and it's um, they are often part of the outer membrane of these gram-negative bacteria. They are also considered extremely heat stable. Um, so I'll come back to this point later. Then we think about toxicity. Exotoxins are considered to be highly toxic. They can often have fatal effects. Uh, on the other hand, endotoxins are weakly toxic and they are rarely considered to be fatal. Immunogenicity, highly immunogenic. They stimulate the production of neutralizing antibodies. They are relatively pure, um, endotoxins on the other hand are relatively poor immunogens and the immune response is generally not sufficient for neutralizing the toxin. Then we come to um, the toxoid potential. The treatment of exotoxins with formaldehyde will destroy the toxicity but the treated toxin remains immunogenic and there is no toxoid potential that's known for endotoxins. 
In terms of fever, um, exotoxins do not produce a fever in the host, while endotoxins are pyrogenic, which means they often produce fever in the host. Let's then come to degree of virulence. How do we determine the degree of virulence? This is often done in what are called lab or animal uh, assays and you can do it with bacteria, you can do it with um, smaller animals like rodents and rats and so on. So that uh, those are standard methods, standard procedures for determining the virulence of different microorganisms. So the same level of contamination of food, water, air by a particular virulent organism when it is uh, going to cause either disease or death then, uh, compared to a less virulent organism. So if you're wondering what that means, let's take a look at, so if we want to look at uh, the degree of virulence in terms of an example, you can refer to figure 11.2 in Brock's textbook. This is an old one. And I've taken uh, some of the data and uh, redrawn the graph over here. So what you see is as a function of cell concentration per ml, what was the percent kill of the mice that were tested? Now it's standard procedure to test the uh, virulence or sometimes the degree of fertility associated with either a toxin or a microbial concentration and so on. So it is standard practice to expose a particular organism. In this case, um, the mice have been exposed to two different species, Streptococcus and Salmonella species. Okay. And this is uh, these data are simply there to tell you which one is more virulent. So let me just explain something. So we have Streptococcus pyogenes that was injected into mice in a bioassay and 10 cells of Streptococcus were uh, related to 10% kill of the mice tested and 100 cells of Streptococcus pyogenes were these 100 cells were capable of killing all of the mice that were tested. Then we come to Salmonella typhimurium. Now 100 cells of Salmonella were injected into mice and 10% kill was obtained with these 100 cells. To get 100% kill of the mice tested, 10 to the power 7 cells of Salmonella were required to get that result okay so streptococcus is definitely far more virulent compared to salmonella uh, so the next thing that we want to know is where are the infections most likely to come from right so what are the major reservoirs of human infections so we have diseases like anthrax brucellosis the biggest reservoirs of infection are cattle, swine, goats and sheep, horses. These are um, the reservoirs where if these animals are infected, they are also likely to pass it on to any human being that is in contact with them. Salmonellosis, uh, the biggest reservoirs are domestic as well as wild animals, poultry products like eggs uh, and water that is polluted with sewage. Botulism comes from soil as well as from contaminated food. Giardiasis uh, comes from beavers, muskrats, marmots and so on. Uh, malaria is from the Anopheles mosquito. Um, plague is from wild rodents. F respiratory diseases, viral or bacterial, can be from infected humans as well as animals. Tetanus, I already mentioned it, it's mostly from soil. It can be from the intestines of uh, different animals where there is fecal contamination in the soil. So very often what happens is that feces from the oil, uh, from animals and birds etc. falls on the soil and therefore the soil contains these organisms. So that is the normal route of transmission. Then we have tuberculosis, we have humans and cattle that can be uh, reservoirs. For typhoid same thing, infected humans or people who are carriers, they may not be sick but they are carrying the uh, microorganism in their blood and so on, so they are also potential reservoirs. 
let's take a look at some types of epidemics we are living like like i said we are living right through the covid 19 pandemic and uh, most of us have become quite familiar with the word epidemic and let's take a look at some of the methods of control and the types of epidemics so there are two major categories one is called the common vehicle epidemic and the second is called host to host epidemic so the first one let's take a look at the first one um, in our country, especially in India, in the monsoon period, you will find that the incidence of food and waterborne diseases generally goes up. And this is because um, you have water logging and because of water logging, the water supply lines are often contaminated with sewage and sewage contains fecal matter. So because fecal matter from healthy as well as infected people is now contaminating the water supplies so the incidence of these food and waterborne diseases tends to be higher during the monsoon season especially in areas where water logging happens so the simplest examples in our country are typhoid cholera hepatitis these are the normal um, widespread uh, occurrences of these diseases happens at that time um, when you have host to host epidemics, just like the one that we are living through, the COVID-19, that's a host to host epidemic where the route of direct contact between an infected person and a not infected person is likely to uh, transmit the virus. So that's an airborne virus. We're calling it an airborne virus. Some of us are very particular and calling it an aerosol associated virus. Regardless, it's coming into the air either through um, uh, nasal uh, droplets or through droplets from the mouth and so on whatever the carrier is it's whatever is present in the air and with it may be direct contact or contact with these uh, droplets either way uh, this is host to host um, epidemic and influenza also fits into the same scheme of things um, let me also share uh, some more examples of epidemics and methods of controlling them. This is from table 14.3 from the text. So examples of common vehicle epidemics, I've already mentioned that typhoid, paratyphoid, bacillary, dysentery, brucellosis, these are all examples of common vehicle epidemics. We've already seen the infective organism and decontamination for typhoid fever, but the best thing to do is decontamination of the food and water that are suspected to be contaminated. That is one thing. And the second thing is pasteurization of milk. And the third thing is vaccination. Uh, for bacillary dysentery, it again has its roots in contaminated food and water. Detection and control of carriers, inspection of food handlers, and decontamination of water supplies are the methods of control. And that from our point of view is what we need to focus on. Then we come to host to host epidemics. So we have respiratory diseases, let's say like diphtheria. Diphtheria is caused by uh, Cornibacterium diphtheriae. Uh, the, the sources of infection are infected people and infected food and fomites. And um, fomites are basically when you have surfaces that are contaminated by the infective agent, by the bacteria. Uh, if someone else comes and touches it, they are likely to carry the infected organism into their system and therefore get infected. So immunization with the diphtheria toxoid and quarantine of the infected individuals is the best way to control it. Um, I will come to the next one that is listed in the table, that's tuberculosis. It's fairly common in India, not very common, but frequently. It has been detected. Mycobacterium tuberculosis comes from the sputum of human um, infected human beings and from contaminated milk as well. So early and extensive treatment of all cases is necessary and pasteurization of the milk is also necessary. Influenza which comes from the flu virus, infected human beings are the sources of infection and the only thing that can be done to control the spread of influenza is vaccination. So these are some of the examples of major epidemics and methods of control.
we can now also look at um, vector borne diseases so having seen airborne foodborne waterborne let's take a look at the next one which is vector borne diseases the biggest one the biggest vector if you might say is the mosquito this mosquitoes of different species aedes aegypti anopheles culex these are some of the common mosquito species which are carriers of other uh, pathogens okay and these other pathogens can be either viruses or protozoa they are all parasites and with the Aedes uh, species of mosquitoes the diseases that are caused are chikungunya dengue which are viral diseases uh, you have lymphatic filariasis which is a parasite or a protozoa then you have rift valley fever yellow fever zika fever all of them are viral fevers then you have Anopheles, the most common disease uh, that's associated in India with um, mosquitoes is malaria. And that's also uh, caused by the actual causative agent is Plasmodium. And there are several species of Plasmodium, Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax. All these are common uh, malaria causing agents that are carried by the mosquito and injected literally injected with a mosquito bite into a human being causing this infection then we come to culex culex is um, the carrier for japanese encephalitis and west nile fever which are both virus related and lymphatic filariasis which is protozoan or parasitic there are several other vectors that are mentioned over here aquatic snails black flies and uh, I'll mention plague. Plague is carried by fleas from rats, rodents and so on into human beings. So the fleas that bite the rats which may be carrying this, uh, your, um, this bacteria called Yersinia pestis, it will, when, in, when it uh, bites a human being, it is going to transmit the bacteria from the rat to the human being. So that was uh, the causative agent of the plague and so many other uh, problems associated with that. Um, I will stop at this point and let's take a look at malaria. Our country is one of the uh, countries that are fairly uh, severely affected by malaria uh, for it's been around for God knows how long but you can see here in this map the distribution of malaria all around the world now all areas of the world are not equally infected or um, affected by this particular uh, disease uh, you have elevated occurrence now there is something that um, is mentioned in the WHO documents as well as other documents that the plasmodium uh, species that is the causative agent of malaria yes um, has become resistant to chloroquine and to other um, drugs perhaps so what you see in this map is a dark brown set of geographic areas where elevated occurrence of chloroquine and multi-resistant uh, malaria is already uh, known okay in our country we do have chloroquine resistant malaria so it's no longer effective and there are other parts of the world much smaller areas where there is no resistance to either uh, plasmodium falciparum or to chloroquine and then there are much larger areas where there is no malaria at all so you can see that um, malaria is very frequent in certain parts of the world and that's clear over here like i said it's one of the most important vector borne diseases that is known even to this day and who the world health organization estimates that malaria caused at least four four hundred and five thousand deaths in 2018 67 percent the bulk of these deaths two-thirds of these deaths were of children below five years of age and the causative agent is the plasmodium species and this plasmodium species is shown over here and you can see it's quite different from other types of uh, microorganisms that we are familiar with so you have the nucleus 
you have a nucleus you have many of the general organelles that we associate with microorganisms are there there are mitochondria there are ribosomes plasma membrane and so on but then there are several other organelles which we are not going to go into that are also present and particularly uh, important in terms of the uh, virulence of this particular microorganism um, let me come to uh, the life cycle of this plasmodium species. So uh, you can refer to the figure mentioned over here 15.29 in the text and I will just uh, briefly describe to you how malaria is transmitted. So let's say you have an infected human being and the um, and you have the infected uh, what are called merozoites um, that are present in the cells in the red blood cells of the infected person they will actually be expelled into the blood yes and uh, they will be producing uh, haploid cells and these haploid, haploid cells are the gametes of the uh, actual uh, diploid cell which will then further reproduce so when a mosquito has these haploid cells in its gut in its blood uh, these gametes both the male as well as the female will be fertilized they will produce the zygote the zygote is diploid and this diploid zygote will grow and result in what are called sporozoids and these sporozoids will be released and when the mosquito bites another human being these sporozoids will be injected into the blood of that person from where they will be transferred to the liver and they will uh, enter into what is called the exoerythrocytic stage and it will form many other uh, types of cells and uh, cause infection of the red blood cells so that is the life cycle of the malaria uh, disease and you can see part of the life cycle is completed in the gut of the anopheles mosquito and part of it in the human uh, infected person let's now come to airborne diseases air like we all know is not very suitable for microbial growth but that does not mean that microorganisms do not uh, exist in air they are constantly being expelled into the environment by infected human beings animals and so many other uh, organisms so airborne organisms are present but they do not grow in air they are there because of other sources. So airborne organisms are derived from soil, water, plants, animals, people and so on. If you were to take a simple test, you know, you can wipe any surface or you can take just as you can take your petri dish with agar in it and just go around the room and um, let it be exposed to air. Take a sterile petri dish with agar in it and expose it to air for less than a minute you will and incubate it after that you will find it steaming with all kinds of organisms so you'll have bacteria you'll have fungus you'll have protozoa all kinds of organisms will be found on the agar media after incubation so that is the that is a um, sort of evidence of the fact that they exist in the air but they don't grow in the air so outdoor air has mainly soil microbes, indoor air has mainly microbes expelled from the human respiratory tract. So a bacteria in a single sneeze, the number of bacterial cells can range from 10,000 to 100,000 cells. Most infections, most airborne infections are due to gram positive bacteria. And I will also mention another schematic that is there in the textbook of respiratory infections and that I'll just mention uh, some of the common respiratory infections that are mentioned in this figure. So the nasal cavity is often colonized by Staphylococcus aureus. This is a pathogenic species. Um, the oral cavity, the mouth, is uh, colonized by Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, you have the pharynx, the larynx. The larynx is uh, the site of the influenza um, bacteria so haemophilus influenza uh, then you have the primary bronchi 
or the bronchus, which is the influenza virus. The secondary bronchus is another species, uh, which I'm not familiar with. And then you have alveolar ducts, the final endpoints of the um, lungs. So you have the alveolar ducts, which are colonized by coxiella, and you have alveolar sacs, which are colonized by chlamydia. Um, so these are some of the respiratory infections which can go from the upper respiratory tract all the way to the ends of the lungs. We then come to waterborne disease outbreaks. Most of you are aware, like, you, like I said, uh, the monsoon season has uh, always been a time when waterborne outbreaks are very common and often you hear your friends, family or even the government sending out messages saying that do not eat and drink. Uh, uh, do not eat food or drink water from sources that are not 100% um, uncontaminated or safe. So vendors, you don't want to go to vendors that are uh, selling food and water for or beverages for that matter. So these kinds of things are very common, especially in our country in the monsoon season. These are all examples of waterborne disease outbreaks due to microorganisms. And you can have all three categories of microorganisms you can have bacterial viral as well as protozoa uh, outbreaks or rather disease outbreaks due to these kinds of microorganisms i've already mentioned that typhoid is caused by salmonella typhi shigellosis is caused by various shigella species salmonellosis is caused by various salmonella species, gastroenteritis, many uh, organisms are involved, E. coli being one of them and like I said E. coli is an opportunistic pathogen in many cases. And then you have viral um, diseases like infectious hepatitis which is caused by hepatitis A virus, poliomyelitis which is caused by the poliovirus, diarrhea which is caused by the Norwalk virus. Then you have dysentery which is caused by entamoeba, histolytica, and then you have gyardiasis by gyardia lamblia. Now, these are all examples of various types of microorganisms that may be present in contaminated water and perhaps even in food. Um, one of the things from the environmental engineering and science point of view that for us, control of these outbreaks is our um, it's our ability to control these outbreaks uh, and that's why we are studying microbiology and all of that. So one of the biggest interventions, you might call it um, treatment technologies that are used and they have been successful in um, reducing the incidence of these waterborne disease outbreaks is basically due to um, water treatment and uh, I'll just give you an example. So public water supplies, especially in the US, have been using filtration. So we have uh, rapid sand filters, which have been in use perhaps as far back as 1905, and chlorination, which has been um, literally the backbone of water supply systems, public water supply systems since 1913. And that has been credited, these two processes together have been credited for reducing the number of typhoid cases in the US from approximately 10,000 to less than 100. So these are all technological interventions that have helped to bring down the incidence of uh, both morbidity and mortality due to waterborne diseases. Foodborne diseases can occur, like I said, due to bacterial or viral contamination of food. We have bacterial outbreaks. So these bacterial outbreaks have already mentioned most of the species. And what are the food products that are likely to be contaminated? The most likely food products that are going to be, that are likely to be contaminated or rather to put it another way, that are most likely to be contaminated by these pathogenic organisms. We have milk and milk products, we have cooked or reheated meat and meat products, we have eggs, rice and starchy foods, canned vegetables. These are all um, highly vulnerable to contamination by these pathogenic species. I will stop at this point. Thank you. And this is this brings me to the end of this topic.